for those of you coming fresh to this podcast, uh, this is what we have so far. We've done 12 chapters. Uh, the stories are all interrelated. In some cases, the stories are connected. And uh, the narrative is focused uh, on the region in the southeastern part of Quebec, known as the Eastern Townships, uh, an area that I've referred to as Quebexico. It's a label given to Quebec uh, by cops, not from the province. And it's meant to imply a sort of dark uh, ex exoticism, uh, though there are also insulting undertones to it, implying that the area is akin to uh, kind of like a third world backwater. And uh, some of the earlier chapters, in case you've forgotten, were Folie à deux, the chapter on uh, SECO, the Government Crime Commission, the Bikers of Sherbrooke, the Dirty Reich, uh, the Biker Priest uh, Jean Salvé, Night of the Long Knives, etc. In the uh, early episodes, we learned that the townships was once kind of a, an idyllic place but that changed with the arrival of the biker gangs and organized crime in the late 1960s. The bikers fooled the local uh, population establishment into thinking they were a bunch of country bumpkins who just wanted to be uh, left alone and ride their choppers. They gained the support of police and clergy and even persuaded some local politicians to provide them with government assistance in the form of funding, in some cases land. But uh, as you know, once you lead the wooden horse through the gates of the city, it's kind of hard to lead it back out again. In 1968, the city of Sherbrooke, uh, the township's anchor municipality, recorded only one murder. By 1974, there was open gang warfare and murder in the downtown streets of the city. And for me, what is interesting is what quickly followed was the era of stranger homicide and sexual murders. This was not unique to Sherbrooke. And so we did a profile on the three cold cases from the late 70s, the Louise Cameron case, Manonzi Bay, and Teresa Allure, my sister. Uh, and along the way, we talked about a different kind of murder, um, the assassination of 18-year-old Kettle Fecteau. And I've been really circumspect about the Fecto matter, but we're going to get right into that uh, beginning in April. It's, for me, a really fascinating case because it appears to be a hybrid between uh, gang-related activity in the early 70s and sexual murders and assaults that uh, began to appear in the later part of the decade, kind of bringing the two worlds of these, this, this story together. And I was recently talking with police about the evolution of sexual murder. And they were explaining to me how uh, early, early on, um, open violence against women, like the 1973 gang rape uh, by 11 members of the Jetans, um, you know, that appeared to be the norm, uh, certainly was the norm all across North America. Uh, I'm sure if you checked it, it's worldwide phenomena, but it appeared to dissipate, stop by the 1970s. Um, qualify that by saying not entirely, and we'll pick up on that a little later. But it did it did appear to ebb, and uh, we were we were saying that you know when when offenders discovered that taking women back to clubhouses and subjecting them to mass sexual assault and humiliation just just wasn't going to be tolerated anymore. They adapted their behavior. And so began the era of killing victims to silence them, the stripping of identities such as purses and wallets, and the disposal of bodies in remote locations. This the last little bit has also been, been kind of a writing lab for me. Um, 
a way to work out discoveries and ideas. Uh, you could really, you could, you could make the case that, uh, for instance, the the chapter Kentucky Fried Murder that we did last time really, if you like chronology, belongs earlier on. You could really shuffle any of these these stories, these chapters, into a different way of um, telling them. Uh, I'm very much kind of uh, a, a William Faulkner kind of guy, which is uh, his ideas that you, you just write and you just get it down, and you can worry later later that it's you know a lot of crap. Fix it. <laughs> Uh, but for God's sakes, just write. Um, you know, that appeared to, uh, you know, it's a different approach to, to, for me, to write quickly, to write on the fly. Uh, so I, you know, there's not a, I, I usually just in the rhythm of the last three months, if, if you really must know, there's like, there's, there's a real machine to this. And I usually write uh, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday mornings early, um, and then edit later in the week and and then do this record and process and edit and add music and add visuals, um, and get up on Sunday and do it all over again. Um, and, and it serves its purpose. You, you, you do, Repetition doesn't always lead to better results, but in this case, for me, it has. It's it's really helped to 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 have a timeline uh, to force product. Um, I don't always recommend that, but I do now. But the interesting thing about that is, um, I kind of took a slab of what I'm talking about right now, and I sent it to my agent, and sort of said, uh, "This could be a a thesis." that I would like to test in a project that we should pitch. What do you think? Um, and he came back immediately and said, I love it. Um, and that, always, that, that, that doesn't, doesn't always happen. Um, when he thinks something is crud, he'll say that's crud, but it worked this time. So I've, I've never done that before. I've never worked in the open. Uh, I know, but I know that that, that is a, an approach that many others are doing, right? They're, you have a podcast that becomes a book and all that. So this particular one is is um, I mean I have I have you know there's another uh, proposal in play that is not that that is like ultra secret and I don't want anyone to know about. Um, but this one isn't that type of thing, and also it you know it it is dovetailing into the American release of Wish You Were Here. So there's there's that alignment and that thinking that is really really important. You know, somebody commented to me, sort of like, "Wow, you know, you're really obsessed with this, and you know, it seems to be all you're doing." Well, that's that's your perception of it, because that's all you know about me. I am uh, I am happy to drop this at any time and ride my bike or. I mean, if if you if you said to me, "Hey, how how would you like to go on a like a cycling tour of San Francisco or something?" I'd be there in a drop of a hat. I wouldn't be doing this crap, that's for sure. So, uh, and then um, you know, my job, my day job is very involving. So I pivot between the two because um, this gets absurd. And, and at the end of the day, this is not very important. I mean, I, I, it's important and uh, specific, you know, to a region. And it's me saying, well, don't don't act like no one never told you so because I'm telling you so. Um, and I'm and I'm losing listeners because I'm talking so specifically, not only I mean, they didn't give a fuck about Quebec to begin with, but now I'm talking about like not even Montreal, Sherbrooke. So, uh, you know, I'm losing engagement and uh, I could be, uh, you know, much more popular if I was talking about, uh, you know, the tri-state area or something like that. But f uh, but for now, I'm willing to forgo all that because I want to tell this story. 
And what's <laughs> somebody asked this? What's Quebecico? That story of a bunch of Montreal bikers salvaging a military plane that crashes into a lake doing in this narrative in the first place uh, i don't know um one reader got really mad at me about it it's, it has nothing to do with anything i guess i really like the story because a, uh, it was told to me by a local guy over a cup of coffee um so it had a real uh earthy tactile feel to it and i liked the idea of trying to land a plane before you even knew uh where this story uh, was going before you even learned how to fly the plane and to be perfectly honest it, i there was a nod there to mordecai Richler's novel solomon gursky was here which is about um, the Brothman family and bootlegging and smuggling and a fatal plane crash. And uh, to hit the point home, this is a portion of the, the opening paragraph of Solomon Gursky's, uh, Solomon Gursky was here. One morning during the record cold spell of 1951, a big, menacing, black bird, the likes of which had never been seen before, soared over the crude mill town of Magog, hard by the Vermont border, swooping low again and again. Luther Hollis brought down the bird with his Springfield. Then the men saw a team of 12 yapping dogs emerge out of the wind and swirling snows of the frozen lake Memphremagog. Switch out the dogs for the boy, Riel Bernay and his snowmobile, and there you have the opening of Quebexico. I should say now that the same guy who told me that story gave me the one about the, the, the chicken guys, the, the murder of Roland Giguer. And like the Quebec, Quebecico story, I barely believed it when he told it to me. <clears throat> Three guys that start a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise in the townships. It sounded like a tall tale. But like the, the salvaged biker plane story, when I went back and I fact-checked it, it was all just the, the, the way he had told it to me. So small towns really shouldn't keep their secrets. They got really rich stories. I like to visualize uh, information using maps. The first map I, I ever used was an old uh, SO road map of southeastern Quebec. And I had it on my wall at work. Uh, and I used these stick pins uh, to mark locations. And this became the basis of the, the first map developed uh, by Kim Rosmo in geographically profiling uh, a series of data points for the cases of Louise Camara, Manon Dubé, and Teresa Lohr. Uh, and, and data, uh, it's just numbers, it's all math. Okay, so uh, I wanted to give you a demonstration of how I use uh, Google uh, Maps to plot a, a lot of um, geographic profiling data. As you can see, this is a map um, from 2002, Teresa Lohr investigation that I created. And you can see the, the majority of points are plotted around the Sherbrooke, Lennoxville area and fingering out to the south. Over here, we see the, uh, the, the Allure activity, where she, the Allure, uh, where the dump site here. And a little further west to the south, the Manon Dubé site. Even further um, west to the south, the uh, Dubé dump site. <clears throat> it's sort of new to what we were talking about uh, beginning in January when we added uh, information about biker gangs. You see up here in Saint-Denis de Brompton, the location of the Jetins. 
HQ and then way way across here to the uh, south uh, east is the location of the Adams HQ. Sort of very interesting to plot that. Um, and with any of this, you know, what I've done is, for instance, if I click on a photo, it'll bring up information. So this this tells me uh, Louise Camera. Um, I believe this particular one is about. Um, Childhood. Okay, this is the the home of of Louise at one four seven three Rue Latin. I can load a photo into it uh, and some descriptive information, and I'll plot it for you. You can change any of these photos. You can load as many photos as you want. If you come over here, you can do some editing on this. If I want to change the icon, I can certainly do that. You see, I have a bunch of preloaded icons. There's different ways of doing this. Um, you know, I could have done uh, layers by uh, uh, by year, kind of doing strata of 60s, the 70s, etc. That's one way of doing it. Um, could have done it by case, layers by case, uh, camera case, the allure case, the Dubé case. Not how I did it, but uh, anyway, that's uh, for another day. If you if you want to do it, you could you could do that. So I'm going to X out of here and uh, for some reason cancel that. Base map. I wanted to give you some examples of some, some other maps, other ways of doing things. This is a much more sophisticated use of ArcGIS. Um, we do this where I work in the city of Durham. CIP Project Viewer, that's just... Um, capital improvement program so this is the mapping of physical assets like parks and fire stations swimming pools water infrastructure and you can see here it's plotted by on this particular tab investment by neighborhood and you see the the strata of, of years you can search on that you can certainly look by a census tract a track it gives you a good idea of um, you know where the assets are come as no surprise. Um, a lot of them, due to things like gentrification, etc. You know, the, the best parks and swimming pools are affluent a a neighborhoods, and then in some challenged neighborhoods, there's not so many things. And that's why we map it this way: is to try to balance out a balancing out of the infrastructure. Um, I've talked an awful lot about um, murder data. Um, the Murder Accountability Project. So here, um, it's a great site. Uh, they use a Tableau to map data. This is just kind of a snapshot of homicide clusters by county. Um, this is North Carolina. North Carolina has a um, uh, hundred counties. Uh, let's focus on this. This is Robeson, Robson County. See. Uh, and with the sliders here, we're having the the resolution rates of homicide. So you know, 50% resolution rate, not very good. Over from 1976 to 2018, you can. And that's the last time I think 2018 they had the FBI uniform crime data. This is all genders, but again, you could slide this to just being female. Take a little time to load back to everyone but Robeson in particular um, not a great resolution rate um, why is that well Robeson and Robeson is a very poor county it's the poor it's poorest county of the hundred counties in North Carolina so something to look at in correlation uh, possibly possibly there so getting back to our map here and not seeing what I wanted to look for. Um, you can you can change the color. I, I use this ochre yellow uh, thing simply because if I do, um, you know, the, everything fades when you do it like that. So I tend to do it this way. I digress. 
So what I wanted to show you um, with this, if we zoom, if we zoom in and uh, so zoom into Lennoxville. This is this this is the Lennoxville area, and uh, so we were talking uh, last time about uh, Roland uh, Jaguer and the location of uh, of um, the uh, um, Pat's KFC, the the location in uh, in in Lennoxville. So it was at one one six Rue Queen, and then that became. Uh, the Charles restaurant with Disco Bob's uh, on top of it, and what I find interesting here is that I mean this is this is not very long here, and you can take like this measuring rod and measure distance. So what is that? Six hundred feet between. What that is telling you is it's six hundred feet between the Georgian, which was located uh, down here. Uh, at this end of Queen Street and the Lion Pub, which is located down here at College and Queen. So about equidistant, about 250 feet, it was this place, Disco Bob's, which we know was um, was subject frequently to, to police raids and all kinds of uh, activities. So that's that's kind of interesting. It's also interesting to note that this area here at College and Queen was an activity of or an area of a lot of activity of sexual assaults in the late seventies and, and early eighties. So we certainly want to take keep an eye on that. And the other thing I'll say about this is um, these these icons can shift. So. Uh, uh, I, I think the Georgian was actually, and I think I can edit this. If you hit edit, you can move the icon. So I believe the Georgian was more here, but sometimes these things will shift over time. So there we've plotted it more appropriately. And uh, the other tricky thing about these these things is, uh, you see there, I'm, I'm talking about Queen Street, but it says Route 143. These, all these things have, have um, multiple names. So Route 143 is is also Queen Street. If you, when we get closer up the block um, towards Sherbrooke, uh, 143 becomes Wellington. So Queen is also 143. It's also Wellington. Um, as uh, we talk an awful lot about King Street, and King Street uh, not only is um, it's King, but it's also Route 112. Second thing I wanted to show you here is, uh, so we've talked an awful lot about, um, well, we've talked an awful lot about Luc Gregoire, uh, a little bit about Carol Fecto, the victim found in, uh, found in uh, East Hereford, and the relationship here between where they were living, where she was living in before she died in 78, where Gregoire was living in the early 80s. Gregoire here on Rue Brooks and Fecto about five houses over on Rue Sanborn. Uh, so that's certainly interesting. The other interesting thing about here is if we go to Wellington, as I said, um, we know there was an Adams uh, motorcycle clank gang clubhouse on Wellington. We don't know exactly where it is, but uh, it might have been, uh, this is South Wellington, but it might have been Wellington North above uh, King Street. I believe it was to the South. So that's something else geographically interesting. Um, kind of wanna keep an eye on and plot. The other thing, so here's another thing we, we talked about, if I zero in here. So certainly, you know, a lot of talk about the Sherbrooke Hussars and they're like garrisoned here on the hill at this location. Uh, uh, Louise Cameron, member of the Hussars. Uh, um, Raymond Roy, our new person of interest in the Cameron place. Uh, 
you know, a member of the SARS, uh, Cameron's boyfriend, uh, Daniel Braun, a member of the SARS. We suspect Gregoire, a member of the SARS. But over here, we learned from Seco was that the Jetins had a clubhouse at this location, which was um, 584 Rue Morial. And it's just sort of interesting that the proximity between uh, this Jetins clubhouse and the Sherbrooke Hussars. I mean, again, it, it may not be anything any more significant than Sherbrooke is a very, very small place. It might be might be something it might be something more uh, that's what I wanted to do uh, moving on to the the uh, Manon Dubé case so I found this interesting uh, when we were talking about Dubé we were we were talking about how she was uh, last seen playing here at Belvedere and Union she walks with her sister towards her home along here when she gets in front of this school as the last place uh, Dubé is is seen and uh, the newspaper La Tribune talked about a possible abduction route which would have to take the offender Dubé in the car along Union um, up this street whose name I, escapes me along L'Acadie and then exiting on Wellington, Wellington <coughs> transitioning into 143, 143, taking you right to the uh, the Dubé uh, dump site. And what is interesting to me here, and I did not fudge this in any way. Uh, you see, I've I, I added since we talked here uh, um, a layer called new information, 2022. I was interested in knowing, uh, I, I knew that uh, Luc Gregoire had uh, robbed a gas station in, uh, in the early 80s. I knew that gas station was uh, located on Wellington. I couldn't quite remember where, so I plotted it in. And when I plotted it in, oops, where was the site of the gas station? Well, it was right here, <laughs> literally at the end of this line that I had drawn um, in that Dubai uh, episode. I did again. I, I did not embellish this or anything. This is exactly where it popped out. He, he, he. So Gregoire um, robbed this gas station. He was probably on foot at that time. He probably didn't have a car at that time. He probably um, ran home, you know, along this route to uh, to um, where is he living here? There he is. Ran home here, much as when, uh, also in the 80s, when he um, raped his victim in the park, a victim in the parking garage, which happened right around here. I don't have it. I don't have it plotted. Probably ran home here. Uh, since I got it up over here, we see the location of the Sherbrooke Pats KFC was right here, off Belvedere and uh, Route 112. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you, if we come over here to um, South uh, West Sherbrooke, uh, here at King 112 and uh, Jacques Cartier, we have the activity of Camera, Camera living here on uh, Rue Bryant. 30 Rue Bryant, and here we have the location of the Provisoire where she was last seen. If you cross the Jacques Cartier Bridge, come into this neighborhood. We go over here. We know that Luc Gregoire lived as a kid here at 3253 Rue de Lormier. Um, but what else do we know? Well, we know when we turn on the new information, oop, Louise Cameron lived here within walking di distance of, uh, Louis, uh, of Luc Gregoire. But what we also now see that has popped up is that uh, Roland Giguere lived at 1060 Rue Genest. Uh, that is the site of the Halloween 1968 um, 
location where he was shot in his car, which again is in the neighborhood of uh, uh, Gregoire and Cameron. Now, I'm not suggesting that these cases are connected, the 68 affair and Louise's 77 affair. In 68, Luke would have been um, eight years old. Louise Cameron would have been about 11 years old. I'm not suggesting that at all. What I, what I am saying is that um, if she's eight, he's or if she's 11, he's eight. Jaguar's got t uh, six young children. It's very likely that they all played together. They knew each other. They were friends. Certainly, uh, Gregoire and, and Cameron would have been aware of this shooting in 68. If not, would have possibly even trick-or-treating at Jaguar's house on hollow that very Halloween night might have come to the door of the Jaguars um, before he was shot about two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I think I think the broader implication here is um, uh, that the more than likely uh, young Luke Gregoire and Louise Cameron was were traumatized by the shooting of Roland Jaguar, if not the entire. Uh, an entire generation of uh, young people growing up in Sherbrooke traumatized not only by that event but by the emerging violence um, that was occurring in the Night of the Long Knives, gang rape, all of these things going on I think would have been new um, and a very traumatizing thing for um, for young people at, at the time. I uh, have a little time so I one other thing I think I think th this is something that confuses people so I may as well show it this is so this is Lennoxville where my sister was last seen you go south of Lennoxville on uh, 108 this is the area where my uh, Teresa's wallet was found so 108, Shaman McDonald, Shaman McDonald bending and turning into Rue Belvedere, <clears throat> which passes uh, the, the Dubai plot points, which passes the Sherbrooke Hussars. Uh, again, a lot, a lot of this could simply mean Sherbrooke is a really small place, and I'm not denying that. But the wallet found here by a farmer uh, whose farm was here, whose daughter was chased in this apple orchard here about a month before Teresa disappeared. At the base um, of Shaman McDonald, we have a location uh, where uh, the daughter was had been earlier assaulted by uh, a guy well, a guy exposed himself down here. We think that was uh, a known sexual predator in the area, uh, Serge uh, Frechette, who I think was finally apprehended in 79. And then down here, this is the location of the female jogger attacked, or the, the jogger who drew the composite that looked an awful lot like Luke Gregoire. Um, when she was drawing, jogging, she was uh, somebody jumped out from the bushes and tried to, well, did pull her into like a, a gold-colored uh, car. So that happened there. So, um, I mean, again, this is just um, a demonstration of how I use uh, um, mapping data. Uh, it works for me. You... Uh, Somebody could do a more sophisticated version uh, using other tools like we've shown before, like Tableau, uh, like ArcGIS, and you could do all kinds of things. Um, I've left things twice now unresolved with these uh, cliffhangers about Jean Charlin and Carol Fecto. I've stated that Fecto was an 18-year-old drug runner from the King and Wellington area whose body was discovered naked in a stream in East Hereford, Quebec in, in June 1978. Uh, Charlin was a small-time hoodlum, a jetain, 
in and out of trouble with the law all his life, who is chiefly remembered for his part in the July 1978 murders of Sherbrooke drug dealer Raymond Grimard and his 20-year-old mistress Manon Bergeron. And I'd say we've now reached the point where you have enough background information and I can tell you this, this really good story about Jean Charlin and Carol Fecteau. Certainly those of you with, you know, the comprehension of French and, and some librarian skills can jump ahead and learn these stories. And if you figure out exactly what's going on and the meaning of them, please let me know because I've been studying them for years and years and I still quite can't figure out what the hell was going on uh, in 78 and 78 uh, and 79 regarding these murders from from a a broader perspective i can tell you that some of this work uh is being done to guide police in their investigations this is this is not rocket science regarding the 1968 murder of Roland Jaguer, we know that a suspect in his 60s was interviewed in the 2000s. And we have also discussed in Folie à deux how an older offender may have mentored a younger offender or offenders in some of the cases in the 70s. And there is a family tie to two murders that span generations, the the Charlins. So you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes or, or, or anything to realize that the Sûreté de Québec might want to examine the file of Roland Jaguer. Never mind that it crosses agency jurisdiction, the SQ and the Sherbrooke police. Jaguer is not your case, but there very well may be answers there to the cases you are trying to solve in the region. Get it? This is who killed Teresa. If you like the podcast, uh, please go to the website, TeresaLore.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E, point com, uh, and support us by uh, following us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can subscribe um, to the Substack account, get a monthly newsletter and uh, all kinds of updates on things that we don't cover here. Um, and then you can you can spread the word and support us that way. Uh, it's always appreciated. Um, give us a review on, on uh, iTunes. Uh, I think it's the best platform. I got a particularly nasty review last time um i also got a really good one but this <laughs> imagine you always focus on the bad it's all relative and it really none of it really matters um but it does matter i want you to give it a good review uh and like it um particularly right now it would really help um so i i i'm not going to soapbox that much longer you know the spiel. You know how it works. Uh, help us out. And that's it. Uh, I'm going to book on out of here. Because it's going to be a great day. And I'm John Allure. And this has been Who Killed Teresa. And you have yourselves a great, great day. <laughs>